if you've ever seen Mad Men, we were yeah. like it, the the prior to ATT paradigm was the Harry Crane paradigm. It was just they had the computer and we did all the measurement and that was it. Now it's the Don Draper paradigm. Like you really have to think like what's going to resonate with these target audiences and 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 that that starts that process doesn't start when you're scaling a game. That process starts when you're specking out a game. That process starts in, you know, the sort of whiteboarding, you know, paper prototype phase. Because you really have to think, like, will this game resonate with this audience, which is big and lucrative? In this episode of Building the Metaverse with John Radoff, John sits down with Eric Sufert. Eric is the author of Freemium Economics... He is also an expert in mobile marketing, growth strategy, and analytics. Let's jump into this fireside chat. All right, Eric, welcome to Building the Metaverse. On this episode, I wanted to talk about a subject that's of real interest to all my followers, which is really how do you scale a business in the metaverse, or more specifically, what that really means today. It's usually how do you scale a game, because games are the applications of the metaverse right now. And this is your area of expertise. So, you know, just to dive in, I thought we should bring people up to speed with a lot of the changes that are happening in the advertising market, because for the past decade, scaling a game usually has meant a pretty significant investment in advertising. So would you mind just like, giving us maybe a little bit of the historical context, like when did advertising networks start to become important? What's kind of the background of the last decade? And then what are the big changes that have happened more recently, like ATT, for example, just to help people understand the shifts in the marketplace? Yeah, sure. So first of all, um, good to see you, John. And uh, thanks for inviting me onto the yeah. podcast. Um, I think if we want to talk about the historical context, I mean, the place to start is 2008, right? I mean, that's the, the dawn of the App Store, right? And when the App Store was announced, it was a seen as a pretty incredible innovation because mm -hmm. those two things, like the distribution mechanic and the, um, the, the hardware form factor, we're not usually sort of fused together in a way that was open to developers, right? So if you think about the development and the distribution paradigm that existed pre-iPhone pre App Store, um, it was OEMs would contract out games, right? Or software to be packaged with the phone, but it wasn't an open App Store. It wasn't something that you right. know the consumer could navigate and, you know, make kind of uh choices around with respect to a catalog of content right right and, now you know, at that time just to put it in context like it was pretty typical at that time for a mobile game developer to to trade like 50 percent of their revenue actually yeah. for these earlier mobile you wouldn't call them app stores but whatever the install environment was for your flip phone or whatever right and you could even compare that to things like if you were in walmart you're probably paying two-thirds back to walmart right. if you're that kind of game so that that's just a little bit of the financial context but go ahead so the the app stores came along and what was what was the change well, just to, just to piggyback on that, I remember my first job in gaming was at a company called Digital Chocolate, uh, which was founded yeah. by Trip Hawkins, you know, EA's founder, mm -hmm. and it was a really it was really early to to Facebook uh, Canvas games, and then transitioned kind of late to to mobile. But there was a guy there, and you know, I was based in Helsinki, uh, and there's a guy there who was kind of an you know an old timer to mobile games, so he had been part of that you know uh, J2ME era of mobile games, and he said that he went to the WWDC where they announced the app store. And when Steve jobs announced a 30% platform fee, people were like stood up in their chairs and started clapping. <laughs> right. I mean, that, that now, was just, now seeing, we hate them. <laughs> they're right. You know, times, times, times change. Right. And, uh, yeah. and norms change. Uh, but so that fusing of this sort of open app store that could be directly contributed to, or, or, uh, or, or populated with, content from developers right that was seen as the as a as a as a uh, just a foundational innovation right in the way to distribute software um especially to to directly to consumers on a device that 
was was just going to become pervasive, right? The mobile phone. Now that wasn't necessarily like a fate accompli or seen as a fate accompli at that time. A lot of people were very pessimistic about the the uh, the potential of the iPhone, right? It was expensive. Who's going to develop these apps? Do people want to play apps or use apps on their phone? Like these were all kind of open questions at the time. When but, I you know, started building them, everybody in the industry told me that it was they were toys. They didn't really right. matter. They weren't even real games. Was what I was told. Right. Most. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, more than so that was. I mean, but, spoiler alert: it's now more than fifty percent of the industry's revenue. Right, right, yeah. But yeah. Keep going. <laughs> spoiler alert: it, it turned into a big business. Um, <laughs> so, but but you know, in that initial phase, right? The the there was not this sort of uh, surplus of or just just. Uh, overwhelming kind of volume of content to choose from right it's just like anything else the platform was new uh developers launched you know pretty clunky looking you know not serious apps right there was like the find the toilet app and the fart app and those kind of things <laughs> uh, or the you, you may if you've seen the and, and just a lot of stuff it was just developers testing out the various uh pieces of hardware in the iphone right so there's the app that you could it, it looked like a full beer if you held it up right and you turned it it, it was kind of looked like you were drinking it right um, yeah. There was the anyway, Make Me Rich app. Your, exactly. There's the, the make, yeah, it cost like six. <laughs> was it like six thousand dollars or something like that. <laughs> I forget. It was some exorbitant price, and it didn't really do anything. And the description yeah. was like, "This app does nothing, but I, but I appreciate you buying it, basically." And of R course, right. some people bought it. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and and interestingly enough, you know, in that era, that that sort of uh, nascent phase of the app store, it was all paid apps, right? And as more developers saw the potential of the ecosystem and money started flowing into uh, you know this this kind of new uh, paradigm of developing apps that you know it, given the, the the potential reach of, of smartphones there was a lot of opportunity to build, build big businesses right um, th there was there was sort of more competition for eyeballs right in 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 the app store and so the the first kind of game to call it gamed or or paid distribution mechanic were these apps that were promotional in nature, but they were sort of like mini app stores in a way. And they, you could pay to have your app be like at the front page. Um, right. And the best example of this is, a, is an app called Op, app gratis. Right. And it was just free apps. Right. So when, when the sort of development paradigm shifted or the monetization paradigm shifted from paid to free, then it, it opened up like a tidal wave of just content on, on it created a tidal wave of content on, on the app store. Because once you once you once you begin sort of like a downward uh, uh, sort of like uh, price squeeze, right? It always ends at zero, right? I mean, there's no it doesn't stop at ten cents or ninety nine cents. It always goes to zero, right? Um, and so that's what happened. And these these kind of gimmicks emerged that allowed developers to reach an audience and and for in exchange for money, right? So people that had command of eyeballs could monetize that, and right? So there were apps like App Gratis where you could per, you could sponsor like the front page and that would deliver so many installs. There were, uh, you know, kind of fraudulent companies that would pay these server farms to download your app a bunch of times. You game the charts. Th that was all very popular, those kind of, you know, sort of gimmick approaches to distribution. And they weren't very sophisticated, right? There wasn't a lot of analysis going into the value of these other than, you know, hey, we spent this much money and we made this much money and we think 90% of that was due to the big boost we got. And so therefore, you know, that's the profitability of the campaign. And then ad networks kind of emerged right so this idea that like well hey there's these apps and so first of all apple cracked down on the app store within the app store approach right they banned mm -hmm. kind of famously banned app gratis uh, it's, a, it's a very right. funny story actually it's, it's a french company ceo you know took off on a plane going from like paris to san francisco and when he landed basically his company was dead because apple had blocked had blocked uh, any future updates for the app and he realized like, okay, well, we, we, they said you run an app store within an app store. You've got to change the, the business model or else we'll never allow you to update your app again. And so effectively the, the company, which had raised a lot of money, or at least that, that product was dead. And they, they kind of pivoted a little bit, but I think they ultimately shut the company down. I don't, I don't really know what happened. Um, but that was, a, that was a, a turning point, right? This idea of like, well, you can't just aggregate a bunch of, of, of eyeballs and then just sort of uh, run distribution via a direct click right you had to build an ad network it had to be an ad right it couldn't be just uh the ability to like install from from the app and now, so just, that just to, pause, yep. just to pause on that because i think that's interesting because 
essentially you here's how i would think of those kind of businesses there's there's a business out there that could have existed that now doesn't really exist which is essentially in the business of curating certain apps and who knows how that could have developed there could have been like specialist categories people who really care about a particular kind of app and they could have featured it reviewed it positioned it and some of these apps that were creating essentially alternate app stores some of them were getting pretty significant traffic so this was a very early way that you could springboard your app into utilization through that apple decided that there could only be one curator which was the app store they would be in charge of that and be responsible for it so so I guess you could say that Apple is actually responsible for making advertising networks the principal way to gain installs on the App Store other than their own curation, which dwindled in value over time. I remember when I shipped my first game on the App Store, which was 2014, I think. Yep. Like we got millions of installs that month. And this was for an iPad only game, by the way, like iPad is a small chunk of the market relative to phones. And we got millions of installs for an iPad game. And that remained true for a while, but ultimately app store featuring became less and less and less important over time. I think by, yeah. by Apple's design, I wonder if they just got sick of hearing from everybody begging them for, for front page treatment, or they couldn't figure out how to really determine who would would end up there they still do it to some extent but it doesn't drive millions and millions of installs like it once did so at everything really went to advertising anyway that's my observation did do you think that that's is that reflect what you think of the market or is there a different way of of thinking about those early changes well that's what happened i don't know that that was intentional i think i think apple regrets losing that curative power through featuring right i mean and you you You've done this. I've done this. I mean, I used to fly from Europe. I mean, I was based in Europe for ten years to Cupertino, to just to, just to, to go to the to altar. <laughs> to, yeah, to, to to kneel at the altar and kiss the ring and, and beg, right? Mm -hmm. And I think they liked having that kind of power over developers. I think that was one of the motivators behind ATT. Hmm. But but you're right. I mean, the the power of featuring the sort of uh, commercial power of featuring diminished, got diminished over time, right? I mean, I, my first GDC presentation, I think was 2014. Um, and I talked about, we launched a game called Jelly Splash when I was at a company called Wooga. And we talked about, you know, how feet, what, what role featuring played in, in the success of that game. And it was pretty substantial. I mean, we got decent featuring, we didn't get headline featuring, right? But I think what happened was they, um, they expanded the like editorial scope of the app store. And so you weren't driving everyone through the same like funnel, right? There were different categories that you could go and explore that had like curated, curated editorial content from Apple. And, and they started adding new featuring placements to those, right? And so if featuring got diluted a little bit just because of that. But also, I mean, it's very, the types of games, the, the, the sort of subgenre uh, depth uh, within, the, within, within mobile, the mobile gaming category increased right and so now it's not you know at back at the at, sort of in that 2014 era there were puzzle games and they were kind of like 4x strategy games but they weren't that, that deep right um mm -hmm. kind of excluding excluding mobile strike um but what happened was the 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 cat the the category sort of um uh like distribution got stratified and then there's all types of subgenres and stuff that were just like inappropriate for a mass market audience the same thing is like if you went and you put a billboard in a very busy intersection in town um you know well that's going to work if it's for something that like a lot that's that's you know if you're advertising a new brand of milk or something, something that people you know everyone Everybody buys bothers. or consumes but if you're advertising something very specific then it you know you're not it, it, very few people it's gonna be rel rel relevant for very few people you'd rather you'd rather advertise to a targeted audience rather than a really broad audience of just randomly selected people right and, and so that's, that's kind of the, part of the reason why uh, featuring became just less valuable. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, there was the rise of these ad networks. There's a big opportunity there to fill, right? And so you had companies like App Lovin, I think was founded in 2014. Um, mm -hmm. You had uh, Amplifier, which was, uh, you know, the sort of precursor company to Unity Ads. Um, Iron Source uh, out of Israel, they had like a legacy desktop business. They pivoted in mobile ads or they created a new mobile ads uh, business. And then any number of kind of DSPs um, 
most of which have have kind of died, right? And now there's been a lot of consolidation in the mobile advertising space and, and, and a, a handful of like big winners. But it was actually, I mean, going back to like that 2014 era, like when when I when we launched that game, Jelly Splash, I mentioned. I mean, I think we launched on something like 20 networks. So we had, it was it was a very di- diverse kind of uh, uh, traffic yep. base. Mm-hmm. And and now you wouldn't do that. There's not there. I don't think I don't think you could find 20 sort of scalable networks that you'd work across. There's kind of four big ad networks, what I call broker networks, like they just sort of sit between publishers and advertisers. Then you have the, you know, what are known as self advertising, self attributing networks, like the, the 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 platforms that sell their own and operate inventory. So you have Facebook, Snap, uh, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, TikTok, um, and then you have a, a, a handful of DSPs, but you know most of them died. There's a handful of big ones. Um, you know, you've got, you've got Liftoff and Mo Loco, which are probably the two biggest, um, and then a, a handful of smaller ones. Um, and that's, and then that's kind of it. And then, you know, that's, there's, and then there's, there's a whole sort of like, uh, you know, uh, set of non-direct response channels that a lot of advertisers are sort of exploring and, and moving into now kind of post privacy changes on Apple, but, but that's it. There's not 20, there's not 20 sort of gaming specific mobile ad networks or mobile DSPs that you'd, you'd operate across. There's, there's just a handful. And that on the broker networks that you were just referring to, so you said there's four of them, just to be clear, who are we talking about there? The, the four biggest, I mean, I'm, I'm probably insulting somebody by saying there's just four, but you know, you've got, <laughs> um, app love in, you know, unity, Mungle and iron source are really the kind of the big four. And unity is interesting to talk about because of course, unity is known as being a 3d engine which they very much are, um, not taking anything away from them with the statement I'm about to make. Um, they're a great 3D engine, great for a lot of game developers. From a revenue standpoint, if you define their company based on revenue, they're really an advertising network company because that's where they're getting virtually, not quite all of their revenue, but the vast majority of their revenue is coming from their ad network operations because they've been able to aggregate so many devices through the Unity 3D engine that they can then have this much more frictionless way of, of getting those developers to take up the Unity ad network, which has led to pretty substantial revenue for them. Right, yeah, it's, um, so I just, just you know, briefly looked it up, or quickly looked it up, it's two, it's two thirds of revenue. So they did about 194.6 million in, in Q4 and then on the um, operate. So they, they divide the business into operate and create. So operate is, is ads and all the IAP supportive stuff mm-hmm. like the analytics. Uh, that did about 200 million, and then they did 100 million by create, right? So it's yeah, it's 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 two two thirds, right? But yeah, it's it's that's that's the company, right? That's that's what the company is. It's it's a big ad network, right? Um, and you know, but I think that the, the interesting thing about looking at these ad networks is they've all sort of um, ex- they've 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 all evolved to be you know very interesting, like and and, and very unique, right? Relative mm-hmm. to one another, they're they're not. You know, if you look at these companies, they have very different profiles, right? So, like, Unity's got engine, ad network, and then they're building a bunch of stuff that kind of, like, connects those two things. Um, AppLovin is a gaming company. AppLovin is, is, is very similar. Like, it's, you know, the, the majority of its revenue comes from its first-party games, and then it's got the ad network uh, that's, you know, that, that, that sort of supports that and sits alongside that. Um, Iron Source, similar. They've got, you know, legacy uh, desktop ad spaces. That didn't get included in the, in the, in the SPAC. Um, so, that. The Iron Source that exists today is a public company, is this mobile ad network, but they've also got, you know, the games business. Uh, so they've got first party, you know, games. Um, so they all kind of have expanded and diversified their operate. Well, I mean, Unity did the opposite. It was a game center first and acquired Amplifier and became, had the network piece. But, but yeah, they all look very different from each other. And Unity doesn't have any games other than the ones their developers make. They don't have first party games. Right. Yeah. Okay, so ad networks ended up becoming really the main way that you could scale a business. I want to get back to like how you launch a game, which might be a little bit different, but in terms of really getting a game big, what's, what has the alternative to an ad network been? Is there an alternative? Are there exceptions that prove the rule? I'm curious about that. Well, first I want to make a distinction. So ad, ad, when I say, when I, hear ad network, I think to one of these broker networks, right? So it's a, it's, it's a network that it's, it's networking these apps, right? It's, so it's, it's creating a network between buyers and sellers. Then you have platforms, right? So I, you know, that I kind of make that distinction yeah. using those words, but you might use different words, but to my mind, a platform is a company that operates a property 
and sells its ad inventory directly, right? So it has an ads platform that sits on top, right? Facebook and Facebook is, that was the games distribution mechanic for mobile yeah. games. That was it. Facebook, Facebook. If you walked into any mobile games studio two years ago and said, show me a breakdown of ad spend by channel, Facebook would be 60 to 70% or more, right? And he scaled, scaled, you know, a million dollars a month plus in ad spend. It, Facebook would, would, would have been the majority, right? And that's probably not true today, or at least it's becoming, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a, we're on a trajectory f to, to where that won't be true because of, because of the privacy changes that, you know, I've written a lot about. I don't, I don't want to beat that, that horse has gone through so much. I don't want to beat it anymore. Um, <laughs> but Facebook, but that it's, I think Facebook is just so important in the history of mobile gaming right it, it basically created it, it, it created the opportunity for these games to reach big audiences right and if you look at a lot of the tools that they rolled out over the course of the last six years th those those were um those those created a lot of a lot of opportunity for mobile gaming to to go through that sort of diversification and and and, and you know deepening process that i talked about that created this this um you know, large stratification of the subgenres, right? So you couldn't really build, so that's, I talked about 2014. So if you think about, um, I was talking about this like 2012 vintage of mobile games, right? It was uh, mobile, uh, Game of War from MZ or Machine Zone at the time. It was Clash of Clans and it was uh, Candy Crush Saga, right? All those games were released in 2012. And, and aside, you know, apart from Game of War, I mean, they're still like perennial top grocers, right? Not top five, but they're still in the top grossing 10 or 20 kind of all the time. Um, and, you know, if you think about those games, they're, they're very, you know, specific, like even Clash of Clans, which is an amazing game, uh, probably one of the best games ever made, right? It's got very broad appeal, just the artwork, the gameplay, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, PVP elements, the sort of guild based, um, you know, uh, uh, gameplay uh, format, it's, it's it, but it's, it's, it's very broad appeal. And, and it, you could spend a lot of money there, but not to the extreme that you see today with some of the sort of uh, 4X build and battle and some of the strategy games, right? And the ability to build those types of games that could that could, that could could have an even more skewed sort of like LTV distribution where you had people spending $10,000 or more, $100,000 over a lifetime. And there are games that have whales, you know, or, or, or high value players to that magnitude. You couldn't do that because finding them wasn't efficient there was just there was no sort of profitable path to doing that but when facebook started rolling out these products that allowed you to tar that that essentially targeted against user profiles that did unlock the ability to do that so if, you know facebook rolling out and then and then it's vo products that it aeo rolled out in like 2016 and then vo rolled out in 2017 you know these products allowed for those types of games to reach commercial scale right and then you think about some of those games and, and then the, but the, the dow numbers dropped for the top grossing uh, titles, right? Because the, the, the sort of monetization power was so extreme. Um, and so that, that was what created that sort of diversification of genres in, in mobile gaming, that Facebook did that. There was no other network that did that. No other network offered those capabilities, right? And so now yeah, we kind of, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so let, let's actually pause there for a moment because I think it's helpful for people to think in terms of the different kind of network effects that exist around the various mechanisms for bringing people to a product, particularly in games. It could be any online application, any quote unquote metaverse thing. But you you wrote something really interesting that I was really intrigued by. And also, I think, um, you know, Facebook gets a lot of criticism f for a lot of reasons and people kind of get caught up in that. And you seem a little more immune to that. You, you kind of have to have this more pragmatic lens on what it does for the ecosystem, which I think I, I just, I want people to be able to hear that as well. So if you look at something like search driven advertising, that, and I don't, I don't wanna to put too many words in your mouth because I think you can help explain it better, but you really contrasted like a search driven advertising where the person already has an intentionality basically, and then ads can be placed that 
our direct response to that interest. It's essentially looking up something in the yellow pages, if anyone remembers what that is, except it's sort of electronically enabled, versus what Facebook seems to be able to do, which is tap into a different network structure where someone may want something and be interested into it, even though they're not actively like in a search mode for it, it allows you to access these different networks of consumers. Anyway, that's kind of how I read your explanation. Now, maybe you can explain it better than I did or, or correct anything that I just said there, but I thought it was an interesting point about the structure of how you can reach consumers for new kinds of products and new genres, new categories. Right, so I, so that, so I kind of operate from this fundamental premise and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the sort of distinction between search and display in a second. But I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I operate from this fundamental premise that advertising does not create demand. You cannot create demand. You can't force somebody to want something, right? So mm -hmm. people already, pe people want things. Um, and, and advertising sort of routes users to the things that they want, right? It, it sort of surfaces um, the, the awareness of products that fit within a demand profile for a specific person, right? Mm -hmm. And on that basis, the purpose then of digital advertising is to optimize that that routing function to the extent that a person gets exposed to the thing that they would most want right and that that the degree to which they want that thing um is quantified in in their willingness to monetize within that thing right so you get these historical profiles that allow for that that measurement to take place now search, so that's display, right? Display, and so display advertising does that really well because you've got people going about their digital lives and, and you push awareness of some, the existence of some product that fits their demand profile to them and allows them to like directly respond to that ad, direct response advertising, and then go and enjoy that product. Search is different. Search is you've got someone who's already actively seeking something out, right? And they're seeking it out on, uh, on a platform that will allow them to find it. And so what you do with search advertising is you just push the promoted product to the top of the search results, right? So, well, maybe they would have discovered that on their own. And so there's this kind of, uh, you know, you, you sort of jeopardize whether that search awareness was of incremental value or not. Meaning, would they have actually discovered your product on the basis of that organic search um, or did you just have to pay the, or, and did you just have to pay to, 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 to sort of be certain that you reach them versus, you know, sort of relying on their ability to sort of root through all the stuff and find your product, which is the most relevant to them. Right. And ultimately search just becomes kind of a tax, especially for digital product catalogs. Right. Google search is a little different because it's, you know, the sort of totality of all information. But a digital product catalog is, is scoped uh, finitely. Right. And so um, there's kind of like a higher probability that someone would have found the thing that they're that they find the most appealing or most relevant without the ad but so it, it be but because you be, be, because you expose them to this ad first well then if 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 especially if you're sort of defending your keyword you just have to be there you have to show up it becomes table stakes right it becomes a tax and it becomes actually uh, a way for the platforms to monetize what they would have given you for free, right? Instead of saying, well, hey, we give you this free discovery um, because we're a platform and people can find you. So now we're actually going to charge you for that now. There's some amount of people that would have found your app on their own, but we're not going to allow them to do that anymore. You got to pay for that too. Um, so, you know, it, it, it and, and measuring the incrementality of that is, is difficult, right? It, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of small developers that you can never be able to do that. So, I, and I'm talking about ASA right, right now, uh, but to some extent, Google Play, because Google Play has had paid placements. But, you know, it, just, it basically just becomes a tax on organic installs. Got it. Okay. You, we talked about ATT a little while back, though, and I, and I don't want to beat the horse too much more in terms of, like, was it right or wrong or all that. But some people may be coming up to speed on, like, what the shifts in the industry are. Like, just briefly explain the change and what kind of seismic shift that was for online advertising and, and why if you're someone launching a game today and maybe you've been working on your game for two years and you weren't paying so much attention, why you're now going to care about this? Right. So, I, I mean, you know, to, just to preface whatever I'm about to say with, you know, I, I don't take an ideological position here except that I think the open internet is a good thing, right? And I mm -hmm. think 
I, I think I think personalized advertising is a public good, right? It benefits publishers, it benefits users, it benefits advertisers, right? So I'm I'm in favor of building systems that optimize for an open internet um, and the and and the sort of uh, uh, benefits that are accrued through personalized advertising. Now that said, the ATT was. Um, you know, is 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 a, is just is just one initiative out of a much broader landscape shift that's been happening and that that will continue to happen, right? So, ATT doesn't sort of stand alone. Um, it's just part of a broader focus on privacy by a lot of big tech platforms, right? And which and and I applaud that that landscape change because I think you know if you looked at some of the things that were happening and and if you talk about ATT, you could just talk about the IDFA, which is the identifier for advertisers. The you know, unique device ID, they were creepy, right? And they were sort of inimical to consumer welfare, right? I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard the story. I mean, there's a bunch of anecdotes, but there was a, a one of the guys that was at the January 6th, uh, you know, event at the Capitol, like he was tracked from by via his IDFA because these ad networks have IDFA uh, being present in just ad requests that also have like a geolocation right now. I mean, I don't want to, that's, that's probably a weird example to bring up because I don't think anyone supports that or not that many people do, right. but that, that guy got identified. Right. And so some people might say, well, good, or, you know, whatever your take is, but I don't think it's not good for people to be identified based on where they've been. You right. Can and imagine then all of the dystopian right. scenarios where it isn't someone who's an easy to identify enemy, basically. R right. I mean, you would get worried about it by having that <laughs> level of surveillance taking place. Exactly. There, you, can, you can imagine events or, or examples of that um, where, where you'd think that's wholly inappropriate. Another example was there was um, a priest who was using Grindr. And uh, through his, that, the priest's IDFA, you know, he was identified, um, mm -hmm. in, which, in which, you know, caused, you know, created, created a danger, right, to, to, to his well-being, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think I, most reasonable people would agree that, like, the ability to do that is really bad. Whatever the context, it's really bad. You don't, you shouldn't be able to be located um, or associated with a specific app's use without your consent, right? That's that's a bad mm -hmm. that's a that's a that's a bad side effect of the sort of pervasiveness of this technology and and uh, and and the and the, the sort of warehousing of IDFAs along with a bunch of other metadata, right? So so it's a good thing that the IDFA is deprecated, right? And Google's following suit. They just announced two weeks ago they're following suit with the GAID, which is the Google ad identifier and um and and the same kind of style of 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 privacy protection is being rolled out on the web and and i think the, you know in broadly speaking i agree with 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 um with the direction that these things are moving and now i might have quibbles with specific implementations but broadly speaking i agree with that i think it's a good thing right so just to just to preface you know that uh, just yeah. to pre preface the att discussion with that so what happened with ATT, right, is, and, 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 you know, this is directed at, like, sort of people that might be thinking about, like, how does this impact my game that I'm going to launch or what mm -hmm. game should I make? It basically rolled back the clock on on all those tools that I was talking about before that, that Facebook built, right? So yeah. if you think about it, ATT was never really going to impact these broker networks, right? That that it just, they don't utilize the, AT, the IDFA in that way. I mean, they, to some extent, yes. Um, they do mostly contextual targeting, so they're not doing like sort of behavioral targeting for the most part. And so they were, their businesses were not really threatened as much by uh, the deprecation of the IDFA with, with ATT. Now, the, the ability to do measurement was, so the ability to sort of tell an advertiser, hey, we, we delivered X many conversions, um, you know, from this amount of campaign spend, that was threatened. But um, there, are, there are ways to sort of circumvent that, not not that break policy, but there are ways to do that in a probabilistic way, like to sort of estimate conversions on, on a cohorted basis. But so their business were never really threatened. ATT really disrupts what I call the hub and spoke model of, of advertising measurement and targeting, which, which was sort of deployed to perfection by Facebook, but also by snap, by TikTok, um, by YouTube, you know, within the UAC framework. So it, it hurt that kind of business, which, which in those types of businesses had made the most use of the IDFA and they, they built robust, you know, these businesses, the, the objective of a business like that is to build robust profiles of users um, so that ads could be personalized and tailored to, to their to their behavioral history. Right. And so, you know, that's that's what ATT does. But again, it's, it's part of a broader, you know, sort of sea change. So so what does that mean? What does that mean when I can no longer 
target a user based on their behavioral history. Well, it means that I can't really commercial, I can't scale uh, uh, niche apps as, as easily, right? Because, you know, if there's sort of like a narrow appeal, um, I can't match the the sort of the the sort of users behavioral history which which is probably a good indicator of of what they want to to enjoy going forward with the most relevant product right i have to actually show ads to a much more diverse and broader audience because i can't do that kind of um that kind of specific targeting right and so that that uh, impacts my ability to to grow a business out of those types of like very narrowly sort of appealing apps. And, and you know, I, you, you, you hear stories and, and, and you can look this up on Sensor Tower, but like a lot of the, the highest grossing kind of Forex strategy games and, and, and like really core, um, or sorry, Forex build and battle and really core strategy games. I mean, they might have DAU of 100K and be doing $200 million in revenue a year, right? Yeah. Because they're, they're just very, very efficient. High at LTV. Yeah, super high LTV, super high ARP DAO, um, because, they're able to find those those very relevant users very efficiently. But when you have to scope your advertising campaign far beyond that sort of nexus of relevance to people that are irrelevant, you know, because you, you have no ability to sort of filter them out, um, then the economics deteriorate quickly. Right, because it's effectively an auction, right? Is that you're, you're, you're bidding for what you're willing to pay for this audience of eyeballs, and if you're average user doesn't monetize at a sufficient rate, you can't make the lines cross, you can't make that profitable. Um, in a case of a really niche game, you can kind of super target them and still get those economics to work, but then it kind of collapses when you try to scale that out to a mass market. So I think what I heard you just say is like, these games with really high ARP DAO, really high LTVs that might only be an audience of 100,000 users on a daily basis, if you tried to bring that same experience to 2 million users a day, you just can't make the math work because the averages won't be there. Right, and and, the, and I think one, one thing that was kind of, I tried to clarify this on, you know, on Mobile Dev Memo, but the thing is the, the, that um, degraded relevance compounds mul through multiple touch points across the funnel, right? Because when you're distributing an app, You've got the ad that you show, right? So there's click through rate on the ad. Then you've got the app store, right? And then you've got to click through and, and install the app. And then you've got the onboarding funnel and then you've got the sort of first purchase moment, right? And so at each one of those waypoints, you lose people, right? Because the app is less relevant. So there's fewer, less people are gonna click in the first place. People that, are, that do click as a, as a group are less likely to install than, the, than prior to the you know, privacy changes. And then the people that do sort of percolate through the install process and make it into the game are less likely to monetize just relative to the same group from before the privacy changes. So those, those, those decreases, those, those, um, you know, uh, reductions in efficiency compound across the funnel. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, if you get a 10% decrease in ads relevance, right, you might end up with like a 50% decrease in sort of monetization just because of that compounding effect. Right. Well, so I guess the question then is, what do people do now in light of that? It sounds like one possibility is if you can create games that are super mass market and broad appeal that are literally that, you know, advertising billboard on Main Street, that right. maybe it still works. Another, another is what you've called content fortresses, which is sort of maybe driving a lot of the consolidation we're seeing in the game industry right now. Do you want to kind of share with with folks like what what does that mean and and how is that change impacting everyone yeah and why are con why is i guess start with it like what led to contra tent fortresses why why are they even happening and and why is that maybe a self-reinforcing feedback loop yeah so so i came up with this idea of a content fortress um a couple a couple months ago maybe nine months ago or something and the idea was um you've got the what what ATT as a policy policy did was it disrupted, you know, I talked about the hub and spoke model. Well, well what I mean by that is, you know, there's a, there's a hub, which is the ad platform and there's spokes are just the advertisers, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and their properties are the spokes that the average, the, the properties that are being advertised are the spokes. And right. So that, so these are clicks on an ad hosted by the hubs 
product or the hub's uh, uh, platform goes to the, the advertised product and then the advertised product beams what I call an event stream, like just all the data, all, all the sort of um, instrumented interactions that the user has with that product back to the that platform and then it does that, it does that profile building, right? It aggregates that data around the profile and it uses that in the future for better targeting, right? Well, what ATT does is it just breaks that, that transmission of data. It says, you can't share data that you collected with your first party relationship with the user with a third party, if the third party is gonna use that for the purposes of ads targeting or ads measurement, right? And so that, that data that got beamed back from the property that was advertised, that, that can't happen anymore. That just has to be encapsulated within that first party data environment, it can't leave, right? So what does that, what, what, kind, of, um, what kind of incentive does that create for the ad platform? The, ad pla the, the incentive it, it creates is to ingest that content into its own first party environment because if it ingests that content, then all those interactions that happen with that content uh, emit data and that data uh, is, is, is the property of that platform and it can use that platform for future ads targeting, right? And so that my idea there was, and you could think of this, uh, you, could, you could obviously see this manifest kind of in multiple ways, but I think the canonical example is Facebook shops, right? Facebook, what Facebook shops is, is basically Facebook's hosted retail uh, program, right? Where uh, a retailer establishes a shop within the Facebook Blue app or within Instagram and sells directly to users within the app, within the Facebook or Instagram app. And when they do that, then the, the sort of the emissions from that transaction, the data emissions, the, the conversion events belong to Facebook and Facebook can then use that data to build the profiles and allow that retailer to advertise, right? Um, in the same way that they did before. Now the retailer loses a lot in that situation because they lose that sort of proprietary relationship with the consumer. Now they're operating on Facebook's terms within Facebook's environment. Um, and by the way, I mean, every, pl every big social platform is doing this. Twitter's doing Twitter shops, TikTok's doing TikTok shops, Snapchat's doing Snapchat shops, because it's, a, it's, a, it's just a no brainer, right? Mm -hmm. and retailers but ha have no choice, right? And these are like a lot of the Shopify retailers. They have no choice but to migrate to one of these, pl one of these platforms or all these platforms because they can't efficiently advertise their products anymore. And actually D2C and Ecom were hit far worse than, they, they were uh, sort of impaired the most as categories by ATT. It wasn't games. Games is impaired pretty significantly. But D2C mm -hmm. and Ecom, I mean, this was like, for a lot of these companies, I mean, this was disastrous, right? Well, but that, Shop that, a lot of Shopify businesses are these little mom and pop businesses where they make something for a niche audience. And they're not, they're not like games where they're set, selling millions of dollars a year. A lot of them are just small. So it yeah. comes back to that niche market making, which, right. which sort of dissipated with the ATT change. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and so, um, well, how, how else might this manifest? Well, I think, you know, another great example of this, and I've written about this, is app loving, right? And so, so how do you build a conf content fortress, first of all? So you, what you want to do is you want to subsume these, these, these content interactions that used to happen off-platform into your platform, right? Such that when they happen, they're first-party data to you, right? Even if you don't own the content, you know, it's just, you're just sort of like publishing it in a way within your own uh, uh, content space. You own the data that gets emitted, right, from the interactions that happen. Right, so, how, so that's a content fortress, right? It's different, a lot of people confuse it for um, a walled garden. Actually, walled garden is different. A walled garden is almost the opposite. With a walled garden, you are trying to get people to sell ads in your platform to, so that users click out and go to, the, go to this third, the, you know, this sort of off-platform property. With a content fortress, yeah. trying to keep them in the content fortress because all the data that, get, that, that gets emitted from the content fortress, you own, right? Well, how else right. could this, what other shape could this take? Well, I, app loving. Right. I mean, because what and so what, what do you need to create a content fortress? You need some sort of content platform and you need ad tech, underlying ad tech so that, you know, you create that virtuous cycle where the content interactions um, get sort of uh, uh, aggregated and warehoused in your first party data environment. And then you've got ad tech that uses that data to then move people around your platform. Right. And so I think Apple Oven's a great example of this. They have the, the, the network, obviously, but they have all this first party uh, this, this whole sort of platform of, uh, or portfolio of first-party games. And so all the data that gets emitted within their first-party games belongs to AppLove, and it's their data. They can use it to do whatever they want, uh, right? And then, well, what, 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 what can they do that? They can sort of like cross-promote people around the portfolio to make the sort of, to, to the right. sort of best, ec best economic, um, you know, uh, uh, outcome. Right, and so that's a good example. I think Zynga was another example, you know, prior, I mean, you know, still is, you know, but, but they bought Chartboost, right? They have a portfolio of first party content. You buy ad tech 
to sort of undergird it. And then all the data that gets emitted from users in your portfolio of first party games is yours to use for targeting within your platform, right? Because that's your data. I think of hyper casual as well as being a big beneficiary because they're just these massive networks of cross promo between each other. It could be, but there's there's sort of um, countervailing forces there. You had a big depression in CPMs uh, in a lot of cases for hyper casual. And so, you know, I agree with that if, if it's operated that way. A lot of hyper casual companies are more, 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 more like publishers. Um, and so they, you know, that's what they do is they'll sort of like say, hey, your app, you basically like you submit an app to these these hyper casual companies, they throw, you know, a thousand users at it or a hundred. They look at the day one retention. Um, and if it's high, if it's, if it's large enough or it's, if it's high enough, then they'll say, okay, well then, uh, we'll point our, our sort of fire hose of, of ad impressions at it and we'll grow and we'll, you know, sort of blow it up. It'll hit the charts. It'll, it'll sort of, uh, benefit from that. Um, and then it'll make a bunch of money in ad revenue and then it'll sort of like settle at some kind of, you know, uh, normalized state. Um, and then, you know, there's sort of res residual value, but a lot of it's just like the, almost like blowing up one of those balloons at a, a circus, right? You sort of just, you blow it up and it, it explodes and sometimes it just sort of falls off the face of the earth, but that's fine because they're cheap to make and there's a lot of developers that want to, um, that want to exist in that ecosystem. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you could see one being run like that if they had proprietary mm -hmm. ad tech, a lot of them don't, but, but some of them do. Mm-hmm. All right, so it's a challenging environment now for an indie game developer, a uh, more niche product. What, what do you do in this market if you don't want to be part of Embracer Group or something like that, or Zynga, or make a mass market game that you know 100 million people are going to want to install? Well, I think I'd probably reconsider the, the not making the mass market game. I mean, I guess if you know, you're really <laughs> committed to some idea, then, mm -hmm. then fine. Um, you know, I think it's, you've got to find ways to maneuver around the, um, the obstacles to scale on the sort of traditional channels, right? And, you, and what I'm seeing a lot of people doing is, you know, first of all, which was kind of interesting to me, you know, in the, in the sort of run up to ATT and, and certainly in the immediate wake, I mean, a lot of people were like discovering TikTok for the first time. But TikTok <laughs> has been an amazing channel for years. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge, 100 billion, or sorry, 1 billion MAUs. I mean, it's giant. And been growing faster than Facebook for the last couple of years, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's nice that they discovered that amazing ads platform. Now, TikTok was, was impacted by ATT as well, uh, probably not to the same extent that Facebook was. But a lot of people were underspending on TikTok to begin with. So there's just, there's just more incremental, you know, opportunity there. Um, but I think what I, I'd say the most common tactic that I've seen developers take post ATT, and again, I mean, ATT was just the first big shock wave to hit mobile, but there are going to be more coming. I mean, the environment is changing, so it's better to be prepared now and future proofed, right? That's why I think relying on workarounds is, is a bad idea because, you know, at, at, at some point there's going to be total enforcement of ATT. And I think trying to rely on like short-term workarounds, you're going to end up just sort of like wasting more energy, right? There's sort of like more kinetic waste in doing that than just building a future-proof like permanent solution. But um, but anyway, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of interest in like influencer type stuff, which is not direct response, right? Mm -hmm. um, out of home, you know, TV, radio, podcasting, all this stuff is, is becoming interesting again, where before it wasn't not because there's no potential there, but because it's harder. It's harder to do measurement, right? It's really, e Facebook is just so easy to spin up, you know, 500K a month in ad spend, right? From zero and, and do it with a small team and do it without having to build internal tools, internal tech. But if you go to these non-direct response channels, you've got to build these kind of like probabilistic measurement solutions yourself, right? Now there are products that, you know, have come to market that attempt to help uh, game developers with this company called Incremental, which I invested in. Um, you know, which is attempting to build like an, or it, sorry, is building an incrementality measurement platform um, where, you know, it's sort of in the background just tells you which channels are driving the sort of most value. Um, and that's really helpful for allocating budget when you don't have that deterministic identifier that you can use for, you know, sort of like deterministic measurement. But, you know, a lot of big advertisers are just building this stuff, this stuff themselves, right? And it, and it makes sense. And, but it's challenging. It's hard. It, it, it requires like a totally different skill set than existed in most you know, kind of medium or small um, game developers uh, before because they just didn't, they just used Facebook and Facebook did all that for them. It did the heavy lifting. Right. So the, the old model was highly oriented towards performance marketing, kind of analytics, 
out essentially outsource uh, the margin optimization to Facebook and, and hope that you could make it work. And if you could, you could just deploy more capital behind it. Now it sounds like we're in the in an age of creativity, actually, like there's influencers, there's community stuff, there's just doing all this other stuff that actually pre the rise of performance marketing seems like the the marketing that everybody used to specialize in for launching products. And also it sounds like in parallel to that, there's an opportunity for, um, was it incremental? That's the name of the company. Yeah. Them and companies like them who, who help bring back some of that performance marketing, analytical insight on top of these more complex marketing programs oriented towards like the social networks that surround influencers and whatnot. So creativity, that's, that's one big takeaway I have. Um, so how do you staff your marketing department now if you're a new game company and you got to think about this stuff? Who, who, who are you wanting to hire onto that team? Well, I think just, to, just I want to, I, I do want to kind of make the point that I think, you know, I, I, I don't see, and I've written about this a bunch of times. Um, I wrote an article recently called The Perilous Mythology of Brand Marketing for Digital Products. And I think, I don't, I don't see brand marketing and, and performance marketing as being like antithetical, right? right. As, as sort of like two opposing ideas um, or two mm -hmm. mutually exclusive ideas. I, I think performance marketing is a framework that any digital product should be wholly dedicated to, right? And brand right, marketing I, I, can fit. Yep. Yeah, I think I've seen a point that you've made is that brand marketing, which I guess we could define broadly as like awareness, public image, influencers, community, can give you a lot of leverage in, say, traditional performance marketing. It helps you optimize for it. I saw the same thing myself, by the way, because it, in Disruptor Beam, where we built a lot of games based on popular TV shows, like our main marketing leverage was just the fact that people already knew what Star Trek was. People already right. knew what Game of Thrones was. And guess what? Our click rates were insanely high compared to right. like what a typical ad would be. So in a, in a sense, while you may not have access to a Game of Thrones that everybody knew about at the time, building some kind of brand marketing that starts to create that awareness or creates an interesting hook for the consumer, maybe that's a pathway to start gaining that leverage in your efforts. And But I also hear you saying performance marketing is a measurement regime that you can also apply to any kind of marketing. So maybe challenge yourself to think about how to apply that analytical framework on top of whatever marketing program you're going to go forward with. Right, exactly. So I think I, I, I see performance marketing as like a, a, a sort of like all encompassing strategy, right? And, and brand marketing would be like a tactic within that strategy. But 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 the, mm -hmm. the, the sort of that that all encompassing strategy means there's a, um, a, a sort of obligation to understand the sort of marginal impact of ad spend, right? Every additional marginal dollar that you spend, there's an obligation to understand how that contributes right now that you could have you have assumptions baked into that, right? Like, for instance, like a, a common um, you know, exercise might be, hey, we want to wrap in this game with an IP. Um, let's go out shopping for IPs. And this is how much we're going to spend for an IP. And when we have, and then having a model that says, okay, well, that, having that IP, having the game wrapped in that IP is going to increase CTR by this much. Um, and here's the, here's the effect on ARP DAO. Uh, and then here's, you know, the effect on retention. And having that baked into the model as like almost like a halo effect on all these other metrics. So that such that, you know, like, and we're going to spend this much on marketing and actually being able to do that will unlock this much additional spend. And so our revenue will be this much, you know, um, higher and, and, and that offsets the cost of the IP or whatever. Um, that kind of that kind of approach would be, you know, taking brand marketing, right, and applying it through a performance marketing framework because the brand would be what you're buying. It's the IP, right? Um, but I think, you know, that I, so what I, what I think, in, in, but, but there's a lot of uh, foundational adjustments that have to happen with the new UA team now, right, mm -hmm. as a result of this. And part of it is, well, that, that branding idea becomes more important because you're not going to be able to pair the a user with like the most relevant content to them just as a result of the the, the ad um, algorithm being that good right and so you have to you find other ways to resonate with them and maybe that's just with an IP that they're familiar with right now there's mm -hmm. got to be there's got to be resonance between the IP and the game mechanic right it's got to make sense they have to be like appropriate uh, uh, an appropriate combination um, you know you're not doing my little pony in a hardcore forex 
building a battle game. It's just not, it's not going to work. Right. But, but, you know, that'd be amazing. Uh, Someone's going to listen to that. Yeah. and take that as a challenge now. I, I predict we'll see it, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, 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 you know, one of the, one of the challenges and, and to your point about creativity is, you know, I wrote this piece like two years ago. Um, and when I wrote it, it was like the most read ever mold of memo article. Um, and I'm just blanking on the name. So let me just search for it real quick. Uh, it's called uh, Mobile Ad Creative, How to Produce and Deploy Advertising Creative at Scale. And it was basically a playbook for not being creative with ad, ad production. Hmm. It was a playbook for just mass experimentation, right? With mm -hmm. like very nuanced variations. Um, and then just feeding that to these ad platforms that were so efficient at pairing the right variation with the right like subgroup right if you had the capacity to produce infinite ad creative and just upload it to facebook right that would give facebook the ability to then test creative at the level of the individual user basically right because you'd have this 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 pool of of ad creative that was so large and vast but also like with within which the the variations were so nuanced right that things could be tested at the level of the you know the individual at the individual user and target at the individual user instead of the groups being size larger than that right then you could imagine like the ad that john radoff sees for a, a specific game is like perfectly tailored to him right and that's mm -hmm. the direction that things were moving in right that that was the process and so really you almost um you you almost sort of like obviated the need for creativity right because cre creativity is sort of bounded right or creativity is scoped with like with by an idea right well if you didn't have to have like actually unique ideas but you could compose uh, images, static images procedurally to, to, to whatever sort of level of, uh, of, of like combinatorial specificity that you don't need to be creative. If you had an algorithm that literally would just pixel by pixel put random things together, it's like the infinite monkeys coming up with Shakespeare, right? right, right. If, you, if you had a machine that could do that, then you don't need to be creative. There's no creativity involved in that. It's just a machine making lots of variations, right? With mm -hmm. almost no human input. Now you can't do that, and there was human input, but the human input required um, was sort of uh, uh, you know min minimal, right? Well, now that's not true. Now you don't have because with ATT there's a lot of restrictions on the number of campaigns that you can run, right? And the way that Facebook operated its algorithm before was just on the basis of testing, right? And so like you know or sort of t t like uh, t testing variants on different audience definitions until it found the right one that was the most performant right well you can't do that anymore because you can only have up to 100 campaign ids for a specific product um and so that limits the ability of the facebook the, the ability of facebook to just test to just experiment to take tons of variants and test them against tons of different um you know sort of specifically defined audiences and find the right pairings right you can't do that anymore and so what does that require that requires like a totally different approach to creative production right because you only get so many different variants that you can test you know, on a, in a week or, you know, in, in a month. Um, and so you have to actually have to inform those creative variants with sort of like human insight. And so think mm -hmm. about what's going to resonate with, with a big audience, what's going to resonate with this audience of men, you know, 35 to, cause again, you, now really all you have to, ta to target against is like demographic features, right. And, and interest features, not mm -hmm. the behavioral profiles that you used to have. And so that takes actually that, you know, this, you know, if, if, if you've ever seen Mad Men, we were yeah. like it, the the prior to ATT paradigm was the Harry Crane paradigm. It was just they had the computer and we did all the measurement and that was it. Now it's a Don Draper paradigm. Like you really have to think like what's going to resonate with these target audiences and 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 that that starts that process doesn't start when you're scaling a game. That process starts when you're specking out a game. That process starts in you know the sort of whiteboarding you know paper prototype phase because you really have to think like will this game resonate with this audience which is big and lucrative. Right. Because Facebook won't be able to do those sort of like hyper targeted pairings anymore. And so you can't build a big business out of a super niche audience. So and, and, and if you want to build that game, that's, you know, you've just have this burning desire to build this specific game. And it's not quite Candy Crush level, you know, total addressable market. You have to be very, very uh, uh, deliberate with your design choices um, and with your sort of promotional choices. And you have to hope that you got those right. Now, you can do some kind of testing like. Uh, before you, you get there with like kind of focus groups or like, you know, sort of limited uh, beta tests and, and sort of like kind of more limited soft launches to just see if what you're building resonates with the audience that you need to go after. But you don't have to, you don't have the ability to just feed Facebook um, a product and have it, have it uh, grow it to its max possible scale via right. that sort of like automated pairing.
That's really interesting that you say that because one of the things that I've been advising a lot of game studios to do now is be a little less married to your game idea. Because what I found in Star Trek, for example, we built five versions of a game and four of those I don't think would have been successful because we did a little bit of prototyping and testing and we just didn't love them enough and we didn't think the players would love them enough. But the fifth one really seemed to capture the magic and that was a a game that got millions and millions of players, mostly organically, by the way, like UA came later in that product's life cycle. Um, but But what came out of that experience is I try to get people to think about really focusing more on the kind of audience that you want to go after and really understanding that audience inside and out and feeling like you understand it intuitively and have a lot of empathy for them. Not that you can't do it through research methods as well, but if you have a lot of empathy, if you really know those kind of players super well, it's going to lead you maybe into some of the intuitions from a game design standpoint that really connects with that audience. But what I'm hearing from you is almost the same thing ought to be happening on the marketing side of the equation from the earliest inception of the game. Like you could be incorporating that way to think about your audience and how you're going to connect with the market for those customers to bring them into this game experience that you ultimately have a lot of intuition for. Start that early rather than late, like the soft launch where you start figuring out how to market to people. Well, yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, you know, prior to ATT, like if your game... um you know, I have this this concept that I came up with a couple of years ago called the power triad of resonance, right? And it, it, you know, you got like the the mechanic of the game, which is usually the kind of the first thing that you decide. Like, a, well, mo- most of the time, like I want to build a match three game. Um, you know, I want to build a forex build and battle, right? That's what I want. I want to build a card game or something, right? A poker game, social casino, whatever. You pick that first. Um, yeah. So you got your your core mechanic, and then you know you've got you know the the tone of of the 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 aesthetic right like so you know let's say that you decide i want to do a uh sorry and then and then you've got the setting right so like let's say that you know you want to build i i i you know i want to build a clash royale clone right but i think you know i'm going to differentiate it by having so it's core mechanics the same uh it's your tower defense and then i want to but i i think i can be i can be more successful uh with a viking setting instead of uh you know the sort of medieval uh 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 kind of setting that they have Mm-hmm. And, and I want to go hyper-realistic instead of cartoonish, right? So now you've got tower defense paired with the setting, which is like Viking universe, right? Uh, guys wearing the, you know, horned hats and stuff. And then you've, but you've got hy- hyper-realistic instead of cartoony and, and upbeat, right? Now, that would be the, the, the setting, the tone, and, and the, the, the core mechanic. And now you just sort of test to see if those are in alignment, right? Now, prior to ATT, if they weren't, well, Facebook would get you to whatever the sort of max scale is for that. Now, maybe it's smaller than you would have hoped. Maybe it's not Clash Royale level scale, but it's enough to be interesting to your company. Well, because Facebook was just so good at doing that. They were so good at finding those people. Well, now it's probably not the case, right? So now you've sort of, if you've gotten to that point, you don't have like an easy out with just like, well, we're, we're, we're sort of like Facebook has gotten us to this, to this sort of scaled us to the, 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 the max potential TAM. It's not blow out amazing hit but it's good enough for us well facebook can't do that for you anymore right and so you're going to end up wasting a lot of money with inefficient marketing to try to scale that to that total potential tam and you probably can't do it right because you can't do that hyper targeted like find the relevant audience for this game which isn't that big but it's big enough to sort of sustain like a you know a a, a, a moderate sized business well you're not going to be able to do that anymore because the 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 economics don't make sense on the acquisition side on the on the scaling side and so you can't, you can't wait to get to that point to discover that, right? Because there's no soft landing, right? It's going to be a hard landing. It's going to be a failure, right? So you have to test all of those assumptions along the way with whatever means that you have at your disposal, which is not mm-hmm. like early ad tests anymore. Because again, Facebook can't find those users for you. Mm-hmm. An- another thing people have been talking about a lot recently, so we can't ignore it, is all this stuff around Web3 and guess we have to say NFTs and building these communities early in game development. The hope for part of it, other than clearly people look at it as potentially almost a crowdsourced funding mechanism, but people also see it as, hey, we get this community of players, they love the game, they're financially incentivized, they're gonna become this vanguard that goes and spreads awareness 
to everybody else. So I'm just, I have thoughts on that, but what, what you, you've been looking at this or hearing about it anyway, what, what's your take on that kind of thesis? Well, I would be, you know, I, I think it's, you, you're right to, you know, anybody's right to be kind of cautious against extrapolating out the success of like some of the first movers in the space um, mm-hmm. to be like a sort of, you know, kind of permanent business principle for these types of games. I just, I don't think you can depend on that. Um, you know, as the space matures and, you know, gets more crowded, you're gonna have to find ways to reach users, right? And I think there's this idea that because there's sort of like inherent value, um, you know, or there's a potential for inherent value and, and you know, monetary value in, in, in the, the sort of accumulation of in-game assets with Web3 that people will just like discover them on their own. But that's just, that's, that goes against the laws of physics, right? Of, of content distribution, that's not gonna happen. Um, and so at some point you have to do marketing, right? Um, you know, I think community development is a form of marketing. And if you can do that well, then you're well positioned, right? There's a lot of people on Discord. There's a lot of people that are receptive to these new projects. Um, but I think once you start to see, you know, Web3 scale beyond like first movers, early adopters, um, you're going to see that you're going to, you're going to just going to run up against the need. You're going to, you're going to confront the need to find ways to, to, to expose people to projects because there's no other way that they'll discover them. Right. And then, and, and that's compounded. Um, or that's like exacerbated by the lack of a centralized app store, right? Because that's a discovery mechanic, you know, uh, you know, flawed as it may be on mobile, it's still a discovery mechanic, but there's not, that doesn't really exist. I mean, I guess discord is the closest thing, you know, there's some websites that rank NFT projects and stuff like that, but they have ads, right? It's gotten so crowded that, you know, the NFT project developers and the web three game developers said, Hey, can I, can you please, you know, you've got all these eyeballs that are of people that are interested in web three. They're, you know, sort of like a, a primed audience, please let me advertise to them. Um, so, you, you know, you saw that develop in the last couple of years. I mean, it's not even that new. So I, I mm-hmm. think like, yeah, community development should always, it, 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 should, it should always be something you consider. Right. And if you've got an easy pathway mm-hmm. to reaching, you know, this, this, these people, which discord is kind of that, but, even a lot of the communities now, they're starting to offer like, you know, sponsorships and stuff like that. So I, I think, um, I don't know that you're gonna be able to rely on that forever. And I don't think that's going to be like a sort of like permanent playbook. I think it's, it's very much, you know, a playbook that suited the times. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing, and it may be even the kind of thing Web3 people don't want to necessarily hear, but when I think about some of the things we've talked about in this conversation, like the ability, at least in the past, of platforms like fi- Facebook to hyper-target within niches, these marketplace platforms where people are buying and selling NFTs, for example, like OpenSea, for example, actually seems like they maybe have the ability to do that because they can, be, they're can. they a place where they're mass aggregating large numbers of people to come in and buy. They can compartmentalize it based on interests. In Web3, you can even look down in wallet histories. It's all basically yeah. fully... Yeah full knowledge of the transaction history in that particular wallet. You can see if someone has been interested in buying something based on a particular category. I suspect Web3 people, a lot of Web3 people would not be in love with the idea that it's sort of uh, say hello to the new boss, same as the old boss. It's OpenSea is the new way to hyper-target consumers and OpenSea isn't the only one. There's a bunch of people trying to do that. There's more curated products like you know, super rare, which are trying to focus on particular niches within digital art. But it's something for people to think about, which is these platforms maybe end up kind of optimizing around the same kinds of things that worked in the past in a less private environment, because blockchain is actually not a private environment. Like it might be anonymous or pseudonymous a lot of the times, but it's definitely not private because everything is transparent into the data stream and right. everybody right. can build off of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I fear that you just spawned a, a, a new form of advertising targeting based on uh, <laughs> combing people's wallets uh, for their transaction history and building building tar- audience <laughs> oh targets. Goodness. I'm going to people are, I'm going to get the hate mail on that one, but uh, uh, I don't no, know. Pat- <laughs> P- patent it, patent it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect uh, folks over at, at a bunch of Web3 marketplaces have, are already thinking about this yeah. and wondering, like, what's the advertising revenue that we're missing out on? Because ultimately, you do need to choose some kind of mechanism for surfacing the kind of content that your audience is interested in. And either it's an auction marketplace where you get 
the most profitable projects, applications, or whatever to be able to surface because they can deploy capital behind it. Or it's more curated and you think you're smarter than that process and you can select for certain audiences that they're interested in. Or you do it through some kind of algorithmic mechanism that then just totally optimizes on interest. It's, it's, it's some version of that. I haven't thought of any. There probably are other versions. I'm just not thinking of it. But but like if you're a if you're a marketplace platform and there's i don't know a billion nfts on there for example like eventually you need a way to sort for people and get them right in front of the stuff that they're going to likely want to transact yeah no no for sure and it, i'm you know um I, the the first you know sort of uh documented uh case of advertising was in ancient greece right advertising a brothel <laughs> so it's you know advertising's not like it i think people kind of associate this advertising with this sort of like new kind of like rapacious um <laughs> you know form of aggressive capitalism that emerged in like the internet age but it's not true i mean it's always existed yeah well ha half our audience just heard okay the and nothing has changed since the days of advertising the brothel they're, yeah. they're still connecting with people's <laughs> base desires i guess right yeah but that's right so I think one of the most actionable pieces of input that people could take away from this, though, is as you're because there's so many new studios and even within established publishers, new projects underway, and they're really just at their formative stages. And the initial conditions you set with these games and projects now is going to determine what a year, two years, even more time and effort that people are putting into these things it will actually be worth after that time elapses and i really want people to think about the skills that they're bringing into their team because that's one of the most important and impactful decisions you can make at the at the formative stages so you already touched on on one aspect of this which is really that ability to connect and understand markets and players based on consumer insights and what they like, like that is becoming more important. But like what, if you could kind of pick your top one or two people to bring in, call it marketing, user acquisition or whatever in the earliest stages of a game's life cycle, or for that matter, like some kind of metaverse application that might be game adjacent, what are, what are those skills that you wanna see that you then feel like that team is is on a pathway to to building something that could scale yeah i think i would i would just break it down into um in into like functional categories right so we already talked about the creative side so in that you know the production of assets right and and but now like kind of incumbent in the that production cycle is audience analysis right um audience identification um, and that's that's a skill set that probably didn't exist within that, you know, so the, the remit for that function before, right? So there's that. There's the media buying piece, which is probably more straightforward, right? I mean, or that's always been kind of straightforward, um, mm -hmm. but just operating on the platforms, right? And, and um, you know, that remains important. But I, I'd say that the piece that, you know, was not new per se, but there's probably like um, increased sort of emphasis on is just the, the measurement side through predictive analytics, right? So like the data science -y type stuff that you've got to do now to determine whether this money that we spent that we can't deterministically, you know, follow, that we can't observe observations for is providing value and what, how much value it's, it's providing. And then how does that sort of uh, render a view of the unit economics of the product, right? And so that piece is probably more critically important now. Um, than it was before because you should you used to be able to outsource that to Facebook, right? Facebook did that for you. Um, and that's why it was such a powerful tool for small studios, right? Because it's very hard and expensive to build a data science team, let alone a, de a dedicated marketing data science team. It's just very, that only big studios could do that, right? And you have to have scale to a certain, uh, to, to a certain extent to, to even be able to think about that. And Facebook did it for you, right? So you just outsourced that heavy lifting to them. Well, now you can't do that. And you've got to bring that internally. Um, and so that's, that's probably like the, the newest uh, or, or like the, 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 the area of the marketing org that requires the most attention for most, most companies. Okay, terrific. I think lots of people find that super helpful. So Eric, what, if they want to find more of the stuff that you write about around user acquisition and mobile games and, and all this stuff, where, where can they find that? 
Uh, so I I have been running a blog for basically a decade called Mobile Dev Memo. It's just mobiledevmemo.com. Uh, I publish you know once a week, and I also am pretty active on Twitter uh, slash you know hyperactive on Twitter. Uh, and, and it's there. It's just at Eric underscore Sufert. Awesome. And in the show notes, we'll include links to all of that. But I awesome. highly recommend everyone uh, read your blog and follow you on Twitter. Like there's the short list of people that I actually have the notification bell on. So I actually see when they post something new and you're one of those. Uh, I oh. think you've got really great insights on the market and everyone would just like get a lot smarter if they listen to more of, of what you're posting. It, it's well worth it. Well, uh, likewise, John, I appreciate the kind words and uh, thank you for inviting me on the podcast. Yeah, totally. And by the way, you know, subscribe down below to this if you enjoyed hearing from Eric here. These are the kind of conversations we have every week or two. And I love to bring in people who are thought leaders on game development, metaverse, technology, analytics, design, all of that stuff. So we're doing this regularly. These are super fun conversations. I learn stuff in every single conversation and I hope you are as well. So thanks for watching this. Hope you'll join us again. Until then, I'll see you in the metaverse. Thanks, Eric, for taking yep. part today. Take care, thank you.